What is neuromuscular scoliosis? When scoliosis is first diagnosed, it is further classified based upon some key variables. First of all, it's the patient's age, whether it's an adolescent, adult, infant, juvenile scoliosis. Also on the condition severity, whether it's mild, moderate, severe, or very severe scoliosis. On the curved location, whether it's a cervical, thoracic, thoracolumbar, or a lumbar scoliosis. And the last thing is condition type, meaning associated with causation. Idiopathic scoliosis, degenerative scoliosis, congenital scoliosis, and neuromuscular scoliosis. Let's talk about all four of these types of scoliosis. So first thing is idiopathic scoliosis. Idiopathic scoliosis is by far the most common diagnosed form of scoliosis, and, and it can affect children and adults. Idiopathic scoliosis means there's no clear association with scoliosis. We don't know the singular cause. In fact, we consider idiopathic scoliosis to be multifactorial. There could be many variables associated with the development of scoliosis, from traumatic to environmental to genetic and everything, and maybe a patient could have more than one variable associated with it. Adolescent idiopathic scoliosis is the most prevalent condition when people think about scoliosis, and it's most often diagnosed between 10 and 18 years of age, meaning the person has an person is in the adolescent age group, and that's when they're diagnosed with idiopathic scoliosis. We don't know what actually happens, but we what causes it, but we don't we do know the trigger for progression is typically associated with growth. Now, when we look at idiopathic scoliosis, the biggest, most common question that gets asked very often is, well, my mom has scoliosis, am I gonna get scoliosis, or I have scoliosis, or my kids gonna have scoliosis. And the truth is, we don't know the impact on genetics. They've done studies on identical twins that they've only found about 60% about of the patients that are identical twins to share scoliosis, and the ones that share don't, may not even have the same size curve or the same type of curve. So therefore, we, don't, we know there's a genetic component or a familiar component, but it's not caused by genetics because if it was, every case of identical twins would both share the exact same type of scoliosis and size. Second type I wanna talk about is degenerative scoliosis. Degenerative scoliosis, it's the second most common type to affect adults behind idiopathic scoliosis. Meaning the most common type of adult scoliosis is, idio is adolescent scoliosis, either undiagnosed or diagnosed as an adolescent, and now they find it in the adult stage causing most likely pain. But degenerative scoliosis occurs in the adult stage and normally something happens to the spine that causes a shift to occur in one very specific area, most commonly in the lumbar spine. And because of this misalignment or shift occurs, the spine starts to go through a rapid phase of degeneration in that area. It is, it is normal and natural degeneration, meaning this is happening as a result of the alignment or weight bearing that's happening, but it's happening at an accelerated a, uh, rate at this area, which can lead to a curve developing. Very often, this is diagnosed in the in 50s or 60 year old women, and it's normally causing low back pain, sciatic pain, and that's what normally brings on the diagnosis. The, four, the third type is something called congenital scoliosis, and congenital scoliosis is not a common type of scoliosis, and this is when you're physically born with scoliosis. And this is, happens because there is a malformation within the spine in, that happens in utero, and the patient's born with something called a hemivertebra or a malformed a bone within the spine, and that malformed bone will cause the occur to occur at that time. Very often, congenital scoliosis could be associated with other congenital anomalies um, within the body. So if there's one congenital anomaly within the body, normally you will be searching the spine to see if there's any congenital abnormalities in the spine to see if the person could be prone to congenital scoliosis. Now, if the person has congenital scoliosis and they're born with scoliosis, unfortunately, growth is also a trigger. As the person grows, the curve can progress rapidly during growth, but normally the curve will be more significant at a younger stage. And the last one we wanna talk about is neuromuscular scoliosis. Now, neuromuscular scoliosis is when a patient has some type of neuromuscular condition. They have an underlying neuromuscular condition, like spina bifida, cerebral palsy, muscular dystrophy, ehlers downer syndrome, neurofibromatosis, Marfan syndrome. These syndromes can have a wide spectrum in terms of their presentation, meaning some of these symptoms can be very mild in their presentation. Other symptoms can be very severe. So therefore, it's kind of like, uh, like autism. Some people have very low, low uh, presenting autism symptoms, and some people have very severe autism types of symptoms. And same thing true with these neuromuscular conditions. Now, these things can affect the connective tissue or the nerve system associated and can, be, uh, can lead to scoliosis. Neuromuscular scoliosis is also more common with something called atypical presentation of scoliosis. Most curves are left lumbar, right thoracic scoliosis. Well, in a neuromuscular 
vector scoliosis, sometimes you can see a left thoracic scoliosis. We saw an atypical presentation. If we see an atypical presentation, we tend to look for more neuromuscular issues. A neuromuscular condition basically is something that affects the muscles, the connective tissue, or the nerve system, the body. Some of these can be very complex conditions. Some of them can be relatively simple. We treat them like idiopathic scoliosis. Most neuromuscular conditions, every component of the neuromuscular condition is treated separately. Meaning if a patient has Marfan syndrome and they have an eye problem, they have a cardiac condition and they have scoliosis, each one of those conditions are treated individually. The cardiologist would take care of the eye problem, the eye doctor would take care of the eye issues, and then somebody who manages on scoliosis would manage the scoliosis. So most neuromuscular scoliosis, even though there's an underlying neuromuscular component that could be associated with the causation, normally they're treated structurally. And by their treat since they're treated structurally, they're treated to manage the scoliosis. Unfortunately, the same thing is associated with neuromuscular conditions. They can progress at the exact same time idiopathic uh, scoliosis progresses, which is during growth. Growth is the trigger for progression during these stages, but sometimes these cases can present with more severe curves at younger ages because they have an underlying cause. Now, what are some symptoms associated with neuromuscular conditions. Well, it's whatever the neuromuscular condition brings forward. If you have something like Marfan syndrome, they could be having really long bones and grow, grow a little tall, and they could have ligament laxity and hyperflexibility. They could be, if they have cerebral palsy, they can have contractures. So it's whatever that's associated with their neuromuscular condition are going to be the symptoms. But the same symptoms for scoliosis that exist for idiopathic, meaning asymmetrical posture, asymmetrical presentation of the body, torso, is by far the number one reason why you would find scoliosis. Um, they, so posture deviation is by far the number one symptom that brings on the diagnosis of scoliosis. Just because you have a neuromuscular problem doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna develop neuromuscular scoliosis. So it doesn't always happen in every case of neuromuscular uh, symptoms or disease, but it is, it is associated with the causation of their scoliosis if they have the neuromuscular condition and scoliosis. Balance issues can be associated with neuromuscular and mobility issues because some neuromuscular conditions can present themselves non-ambulatory because of the severity of their neuromuscular condition. So like I said, even though not every patient with neuromuscular, neuromuscular disease develops a scoliosis, the condition can vary in its complexity. Some of them are very, very complex and can be very, very difficult to treat, while others are more simple to treat and are treated just like an idiopathic case. So when, even though there's never, ever a guarantee with treatment, and there's never any harm in being evaluated to see if your neuromuscular scoliosis can be treated in a conservative manner, because most neuromuscular patients, if they have a severe neuromuscular condition, are normally having lots of surgeries and lots of interventions and lots of things that are done. And if they can do something to manage your scoliosis to prevent further surgeries and further interventions, that can always, it can only mean a more positive outcome for their health and well-being. Thanks for watching. I hope you found this information helpful. If you'd like to hear about other topics and information on scoliosis, type in the comments below and let us know. And finally, subscribe and hit the bell icon to be notified of when we publish content. Thanks.